Yes, it seems that we have had an interruption, so uh, we'll just bear with us. Hopefully, Lerato can join us again. Lerato, are you there? Maybe we should just be patient for a moment. There we go. This is coming. Welcome back. Oh, Please. I was cut. <laughs> yes. Yeah, oh, it no. seems the Wi-Fi is uh, slipping up on us. But uh, oh, please go okay. ahead and load your presentation and maybe try to start from where you left off. Okay. Where, where where did I cut off? Uh, I think you can start right here. That's fine. Okay. On the methodology or the aim, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Yes, indeed. Uh, the gap was identified. The aim was to document medicinal plants that are used for treatment of TB and other respiratory tract infections, and also to evaluate their antibacterial activity. Uh, information regarding ethnobotanical data was uh, derived by interviewing traditional practitioners in the Maseru district, which is the largest uh, and the capital city. And uh, this information has also been uh, published. Now, after that, uh, then it was the literature survey to assess if uh, the recorded plants that are used for TB and other respiratory tract infections uh, have been screened previously for antimicrobial activity. And uh, if not, those plants that were not screened were then collected and uh, screened. And uh, antimicrobial activity was conducted, the assay was conducted using minimum inhibition concentration assay. And seven pathogens were selected, mainly based on uh, availability and prevalence, with uh, two being mycobacteria and five uh, being the other RTI pathogens. And these are the seven pathogens that were selected uh, in terms of the TB and five in terms of the other RTIs. Ethnobotanical information that was collected revealed that indeed uh, R, uh, the most uh, treated uh, RTI was TB, which was followed by other RTIs like coughs, colds, and asthma. And uh, 34 plants were recorded for treatment of TB, uh, with 45 recorded for treatment of other RTIs. And there was a case whereby both uh, plants were recorded for treatment of both TB and RTIs, and those that were not screened indeed were uh, screened uh, in the study. And the plants that were sort of uh, uh, present under both TB and uh, other RTI treatment included such things, uh, such plants as uh, Helichrysum suspititium, uh, Helichrysum odorotismum, and Pentanesium prinoloides. Now, in terms of the anti uh, antibacterial activity, the results that are shown here are those of plants that are were displaying noteworthy or moderate antibacterial activity. Those that are in bold only uh, show moderate activity, but those that are in both bold and italics uh, showed noteworthy activity. And uh, here, only four plants uh, showed such activity, hence are uh, shown here. Those that did not show activity were excluded uh, in this uh, results. So looking at the first plant, uh, Gebera pilosoloides, it was uh, showing moderate activity against Mycobacteria fortuitum, and uh, Metalasia muricata was showing activity against uh, Enterobacter or Myche, and uh, Tessium costetum was also showing a noteworthy activity against the same pathogen. The last plant, Withania somnivera, seemed to be having a wide range whereby it was displaying a moderate activity against Mycobacterium fortuitum, but it was also showing a noteworthy activity against 
uh, Staphylococcus aureus, also against uh, Moraxella catahalis. Now, uh, of the plants that were screened, as I've just highlighted, we had Gebera pilosiloides and withania, somnifera showing uh, activity, moderate uh, activity against uh, mycobacteria uh, tritum, which could at least support the use of these plants uh, for treatment of TB. And in the case of other respiratory tract infections, uh, withania, as I've just mentioned, showed so much uh, activity against uh, S. aureus and also Moraxella catahalis. And other species that also showed a uh, noteworthy activity uh, against respiratory tract uh, pathogens uh, are Tessium costatum and Metallasia muricata, which were active against Enterobacter homache. Uh, indeed, uh, from the results, it was observed that such species such as uh, Tessium costatum, uh, even though widely distributed in Southern Africa, seem to be limited in terms of their medicinal use to the Basutu people. And uh, this was also observed in the fact that its antimicrobial activity was being reported in this study for the first time. Now, the results of the study have also been published in the South African Journal of Botany recently, last year. And to wrap up, uh, plants that were found to be used for treatment of RTIs uh, in the Maseru district of Lesotho included Artemisia afra. We didn't see this in our antimicrobial activity assay because they had already been uh, screened uh, from the literature survey that had been conducted and uh, such species as mentha longifolia as well, uh, pelagonium, they seem to be making it to the list of plants that were recorded and found to be uh, highly used in, uh, for treatment of TB and other RTIs. And we found that uh, when these plants were screened uh, for antibacterial activity, uh, two plants, uh, Gebera, Pilosiloides, and Methania somnifera, displayed moderate activity against one of the two mycobacteria. And Withania seemed also to be uh, displaying noteworthy activity against uh, other RTI pathogens. And we had also uh, some noteworthy activity uh, in terms of the RTI pathogens from Tessium costatum and Metallasia muricata. And uh, we, as I mentioned that some of the plants that did not show activity uh, were excluded from just this results, but we had uh, some of them that were being reported for a, a antibacterial activity in this current study, uh, such as Ajuga or Fridays. And indeed, we can see that because there's some antibacterial activity observed in some of the plants, we can agree that they do support the traditional medic uh, traditional use uh, being uh, undertaken in this country for treatment of TB and other RTIs. And going forward, there is need to assess the plants, uh, the antibacterial activity in terms of a uh, combination and see if we'll observe the same activity or even a, a better a, a MIC. And also there is need to extend the survey to other parts of the country to see if we still have a similar pattern uh, as compared to the Maseru district. And in finishing, I would like to acknowledge different institutions and individuals for the support in the study, and in particular, University of Johannesburg, which is my second home, and uh, vets, as well as different individuals that supported this particular work. And these are some of the references that I used in this study. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Lerato. That was an excellent and a very uh, uh, concise uh, presentation. I enjoyed it very much. I think uh, you must stay on board because we, we, we will probably have some questions. I hope we have some questions. I have many questions for you. And we are fortunate to have a lot of time for questions because we are well ahead of schedule. So one obvious question that I would like to ask you if you are still there is uh, the traditional uh, dosage form for these antirespiratory 
plants because it i'm thinking that uh, if you use an infusion then then you will retain some of the aromatic compounds in other words if people just throw boiling water over the leaves let's say and drink it or if they boil it for extended periods then one may tend to lose the essential oils because they are volatile okay can you just give us uh, some information on the general pattern of dosage uh, for these plants uh, is it mainly mainly decoctions or or mainly infusions thank you prof for the question indeed there is variation from one traditional practitioner to another there is no consistency at all because there's also uh, i also asked some of them in terms of uh, toxicity whether don't they think that when you increase the dosage uh, to a certain extent it might be toxic because even the toxicity there the, is there wasn't that uh, information so uh, the, some of them we're using infusions as well. So I think for future studies, there is need to compare and find out if we will be able to find the same, even the same activity from preparations, uh, especially of those that use infusions and all those that uh, do the boiling in different ways. But I, uh, the, the traditional healers really, they don't, uh, they don't have that consistency in terms of the dosage. Yes, yes, thank you. And uh, do you perhaps have any examples of plants that are eaten rather than prepared as a, as a liquid? Is, is that also practiced in Lesotho, where you just chew the leaves when you're, when you're in the mountain or something like that? You have a cough or something? Yes, <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, some of them, like Artemisia afra, some will say we just insert them in the nose, in the nostrils, but some of them oh. say no, we chew the leaves. Uh, oh, yes. when we are out there and there's nothing to there's no water uh, to sort of prepare the concoction they'll say they chew the leaves yeah because it, it's actually historically interesting because the presence of sun people in the sutra is very clear from the beautiful rock art and it is very likely that that some of the sun customs have have been taken over by the basutu people and so that that chewing i think is a typical sun uh, sun thing that <laughs> that we that inherited yes yes very yes. interesting i have so many questions so, uh, laratu may i ask you why well, should say dr laratu um <laughs> th that uh, that plant with the red berries that you showed uh, now i know often when we prepare a lecture we we just look quickly for a photo because the photo that you showed is of uh, Solanum pseudocopsicum, uh, whereas you you, you intended oh. to be Vadania somnifera. So I'm yes. hoping that you identified Vadania somnifera correctly, <laughs> because it's a difference, you know. Okay, Pro. Um, Noted. And the goal is, indeed was so, with Vadania somnifera. Yeah, 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 yeah. You see that that plant is a very common weed, the, the Solanum pseudocopsicum. It looks like a like a capsicum, like a like a, a chili, a round fruited chili. Yes. Uh, but Dania's fruits are enclosed in a in a uh, inflated a calyx. Yes, a cold, a hard like, cold. Like, a, like a like a like the Cape gooseberry, you know, okay. that type of uh, enlarged uh, uh, and a crescent uh, uh, calyx. Yes. So no, just just to note, but I'm I'm relieved to hear that it was indeed with Anya that was studied. Any more okay. questions? Uh, let's ask. Ida ask is asking, is steaming practiced for treatment? Yeah, that's a good question. Come again, Pro. It, is steaming used? Do people steam for respiratory ailments? I can oh, imagine yes. they do. <laughs> Indeed, what we have also even observed with uh, COVID as well, there is a lot of steaming uh, where people take, for example, eucalyptus, some people even use a uh, botlesia, salfifolia, some even steam using uh, Artemisia afra. Uh, and uh, all these plants that are reported for, for treatment of respiratory tract infections, some will even use the steaming. Uh, and they believe in it so much in Lesotho. Nowadays, even with the onset of COVID, in every household, people do steam. And they, they report that it seems to be working. Yeah, that's, that seems to be a universal 
method. Uh, to, to, that is true aromatherapy, that the aroma <laughs> essential oil go into your lungs. What's unique, I think, uh, to some extent in the situ is the widely uh, pra wide practice of smoking things. So there it's not the essential oil that's going down, it's actually modified chemicals that goes in in the smoke, in the form of smoke, uh, which, is, which is also interesting. Rato, thank you very much for an interesting lecture. I think we can move on and hopefully um, we have Patricia. Um, hopefully Patricia has sorted out her problems by now. Patricia, are you there? Not yet? No, pro no Patricia's lost connectivity completely. She's oh, not even good. online anymore. Um, they have asked if I can play a voice note for her. Try it's something that the system can do, um, but I'm going to. I'm waiting for it from them, and I'll see what I can do. So in the meantime, we can move to the last lecture, and that lecture is by Kolwani uh, Sila Luke, and she's going to present to us a, a lecture on the chemistry of meliaceae of some. Uh, Meliaceae, you know, the meliaceae are often used as insecticides, uh, the famous neem, for example, neem tree. And so she has looked into the phytochemistry and anti uh, insecticidal properties of some meliaceae. That proves to, going to be a very interesting lecture. I'm looking forward to it. So, Kolwani, please go ahead, load your presentation and, and start. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Can you all see my presentation? You can go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Um, as Prof has mentioned, uh, my talk is titled An Evaluation of Insecticidal Activities and Phytochemical Properties of Selected Members of the Family Meliese Used Traditionally as Insecticides. This study was prompted by the alarming reports of the lecturer's effect caused by insect pests in the agricultural sector, which put a strain in the global food production, as these insects mostly attack crops that forms part of the staple food in most developing countries. And storage and field pests have been reported to destroy about one third of this global food production every year. And for years, synthetic pesticides have been commonly used and are regarded as a highly effective means of controlling this pest. However, discriminate use results in environmental and health hazards to both humans and animals. And due to these alarming results caused by the chemical pesticides to the environment and human health, there has been an increasing demand for safer and biodegradable alternatives to manage this insect pest. And plants are known to be rich sources of bioactive chemicals, and hence it was not a surprise when botanical insecticides emerged as a promising alternative to the chemical pesticides as they are less uh, persistent, they are more biodegradable and have a lower mammalian toxicity. And medicine oh, species, sorry? Your slides aren't progressing. I'm not too sure if you've moved on your slides. Oh, from my side, they are. Sorry about that. No problem. Uh, are they progressing now? No, it's not. And um, perhaps you can stop your share and then restart it again. Okay. Oh, okay. Are they progressing now? Before Are you I sharing can... your screen? So let's quickly, let's stop the share again and then open up your presentation in slideshow. Okay. Okay. And then are you on a Mac or you're on a Windows computer? Windows. Okay, then hold the Windows key um, down in your, on your laptop on the keyboard and press the letter D.
for desktop. Okay. Okay, and then come back into Remo and click share and then click window and then share the window that has it says PowerPoint slideshow. Okay. I just did. Uh, are they progressing now? Let's move on. It says introduction. It's, there we go. Well done. Okay. Um, should I begin from the introduction? Okay, I'll just Please, start just from the in. beginning. Uh, this study was prompted by the alarming reports uh, of the lecturer's effects caused by insect pests in the agricultural sector, which put a strain in the global food production. As insect pests mostly attack crops that forms part of the stable food in most developing countries. And storage and field pests have been reported to destroy about one third of this global food production every year. And for years, synthetic pesticides have been commonly used and are regarded as a highly effective means of controlling this insect pest. However, their indiscriminate use results in environmental and health hazards to both humans and animals. And due to these alarming uh, results caused by the chemical pesticides to the environment and human health, there has been an agent increasing demand for safer and biodegradable alternatives to manage this pest. And plants are known to be rich sources of bioactive chemicals, and hence it was not a surprise when botanical insecticides emerged as a promising uh, alternative to chemical pesticides as they are more biodegradable, they are less persistent, and they have a low mammalian toxicity. And meliaceous species are evaluated in this study because to plant selection, an ethnobotanical literature survey was conducted and it indicated that a Medjese family has the highest number of species which are used traditionally as pest control. And this is due to the presence of terpenoids, specifically luminoids, in most of their species, and hence its systematic investigation. And the study aimed to assess the antifidant and insecticidal properties of selected South African species of the family Meliesi against the Plutella xylostella, which is commonly known as the diamond bag moth, or simply DBM, and the Spodoptera frugipeta, commonly known as the Foley armyworm, or just the FAW, and evaluate their phytochemical properties. Here's a schematic representation of the methodology which was used for the sample preparation for the insecticidal and antifidant activities. Here, aqueous acetone and ethanol extracts were used for the testing. And two bioassays were used for this testing. The first one was the feeding deterrence test. Here, maize leaves were used as test food for the foley armyworm and cabbage for the diamond bag moth. And the leaves here were saturated by dipping in 1% extract solution of either water, acetone, or ethanol. And then the leaves were weighed before they were presented to the larvae in a petri dish. And after 24 hours, uh, the leaves were reweighed again and the results were uh, recorded. And the feeding of insects uh, were recorded under three conditions. Condition one was a choice test. They were in a petri dish, one leaf was treated and the other one was not treated. Um, and then the second one was the pure food test. Uh, here, both the two leaves were not treated. And then the last one was the no choice test. Here, both the leaves were treated. And then the second uh, bioassay was the topical application bioassay. Here, 10 microliters of each 0 0.5 or 1% uh, extract solution were applied to the dosum of, if, of each larva, and uh, five larvae were treated at each dose and then transferred to a petri dish. Uh, here's a schematic representation of the methodology for the sample preparation for the preliminary phytochemical. Um, and uh, GCMS uh, was also used to analyze the type of uh, chemical compounds present in each extract, and then hexane extracts were then were used for this GCMS. And for the feeding deterrence test, 
plants that have anti-feeding activities are those that have compounds that once they are consumed uh, they cause the insect to stop feeding and eventually results in insect dying because of starvation uh, and then table one here shows us the results for the feeding deterrence uh, against the foley armyworm larvae here the extracts which recorded the highest uh, feeding deterrence were the acetone extract of Cedrella or Dorata were ranked the highest on the efficiency rank. And when comparing the different uh, extracts uh, out of the nine uh, species which were evaluated, six of them had aqueous extract uh, having the highest feeding deterrence. And this was Formelia as a direct, Chukila emetica, Turea floribunda, Tukila Georgina, Ekebekia capensis, and lastly, Kaya anthothica. And the uh, aqueous extracts of Cetrella odorata and um, ethanol extracts of Turia floribunda uh, were recorded to have inect compounds as they recorded negative feeding deterrence coefficients. And table two shows us the results for the feeding deterrence against the DBM larvae. Here, all extracts exhibited feeding deterrence to some extent, except for the acetone and ethanol extracts of tuna ciliata and the um, extracts which had the highest feeding deterrence were acetone extracts of trichila, trichina, ethanol, and acetone extracts of cedrella odorata, and they were all ranked the highest of the, on the efficiency rank. And when comparing the different extracts, extracts uh, which had the highest in this case were ethanol extracts, and it was for Cedrella odorata, Trichila emetica, Echebecchia capensis, Melia ezedirat, and Turia floribunda. And here it was also quite surprising to see that uh, either um, aqueous acetone or ethanol extract of Melia ezedirat had a, a higher feeding deterrence against this DBM larvae as um, contrary to previous studies where it was found that they have excellent feeding deterrence. And table three shows us the results for the tropical application for the fully armyworm larvae. Here the highest mortality rate was recorded at 80%. And this was for aqueous extracts of Echebecchia capensis and ethanol extracts of Kaya anthotica. And the least uh, mortality rate was recorded at 20%. And these were for aqueous and acetone extracts of Kaya anthotica and ethanol extracts of Turia floribunda. Uh, and here also, a probability unit uh, analysis was also used to study the concentration to mortality rate and extracts uh, which had the lowest uh, LD50 values were regarded, were regarded to be more toxic to the foley armyworm larvae and these were for uh, aqueous extracts of Echebecchia capensis and ethanol extracts of Kaya and Sothica and these results uh, did correlate with the average uh, mortality rate percentages of uh, larvae. And the ones with the highest LD50 values were found to be less toxic to the larvae. And this was the ethanol extract of Echebecchia capensis and the extracts of Trichila emetica. Table four shows us the tropical application bioEC results for the DBM larvae. Here uh, also unsurprisingly, all extracts uh, of Melia as a direct indicated uh, the highest mortality rate uh, against the DBM at 80% and the lowest uh, mortality rate were recorded at 30%, which was ethanol extracts of Cedrella odorata, acetone extracts of Kaya anthothica, aqueous and acetone extracts of Tuna ciliata, and lastly, acetone extracts of Tisufolia. And uh, also not surprisingly, uh, all extracts of Melia as a direct were found to be more toxic uh, to the DBM. And uh, here quite a number of um, different plant extracts displayed insignificant uh, toxicity to the DBM as compared to the foliar armyworm larvae. 
And uh, when it comes to the qualitative phytochemical screening, here in overall, a number of uh, positive results were found, and this can be due to the fact that plants harbor an array of chemical constituents. And um, when you look at table five, which shows the preliminary phytochemical results um, of importance here were the alkaloids, terpenoids, and phenolic compounds. As in the study by Iman in 2002, we've, we, we saw that uh, they found that uh, these three compounds are the major classes in which most insect and pathogen possesses. And this can also confirm most of the uh, insecticidal and tropical application results that we obtained, as, um, as we can see from the table again that uh, all the plants uh, contain uh, at least one of these uh, major groups. And when we look at the GCMS analysis results, we found that Cetrella odorata had 57 compounds, AKB carbensis extract had 74, Kaya anthotica had 36, Miller as a direct had 53, Tuna ciliata had 61, Tequila emetica had 77, Tequila dregina had 72, and Turea floribunda had 85, and lastly, Turea uh, obsessiva had 89. And these compounds were classified into secondary metabolized classes, whereby we found that uh, alkenes, phenols, and terpenes were found to be the most common groups which were present among all the plants extract and of importance uh, were the phenols and the terpenes as these um, are well known to have insecticidal and antifidin properties. And in overall, these results lend a scientific credence uh, to the traditional milieu species as potential biocontrol agents against uh, insect pest. And in conclusion, the data obtained in this study uh, confirmed many previous reports, and it can lead to the conclusion that Meliese extracts can be considered as effective botanical insecticides. And phytochemical contents of the plant extract, which we, which we evaluated, did correlate with their insecticidal and antifidant activities against both the fall armyworm and the diamondback moth larvae. And out of the nine species which uh, we evaluated, five of them merit further investigation as they have shown excellent results. And these were Cedrella odorata, Echebechia capensis, Mela ezadirat, Trichila emetica, and Trichila dregina. And uh, recommendations for future studies uh, will be to investigate the extracts further to check if they're able to maintain yield at comparable levels to synthetic pesticide use. And uh, when we're doing this, we have, we have to also bear in mind that um, from previous studies uh, which attempted to do this comparison, they found that um, the trade-off between lower mortality rate for lower environmental persistence need to be seriously considered, particularly as there's growing evidence that less toxic botanical insecticides can help facilitate natural pest regulation whilst not significantly sacrificing crop yield. And uh, here are the references that I've used in this presentation. And I would like to thank my supervisor, Professor Anna Mutiti, co-supervisor, Prof. Heno Kinfe, and Ms. Alison Young from UKZN Botanical Garden and Mr. Debuko Mailula and Mr. Serge Mosiani from ARC and the Department of Biotechnology and Food Technology at our DFC campus here at UJ and also thank the university and NRF for funding my research. Thank you. Thank you, Kolwani, for an excellent lecture. That was very interesting. I think uh, this is a, a particularly relevant topic because it uh, there is certainly the potential for for product development. And I'm wondering yeah. if uh, we didn't mention too much of that. I'm wondering if if you are planning to do in future field studies because uh, you know when we spray in practice a crop, then then maybe the principles are a bit different from a laboratory study. For example, under rainy conditions, the 
the compounds may wash off or whatever. Um, can you just give us some idea of what what would one do um, to develop the concept of products? Will it be a powder? Will it be an extract? Uh, is it necessary to identify the main luminoids? The, because the luminoids, of course, are the terpenoids that are antifeedants in, in milia, you see. Uh, just some thoughts that you have on the potential for product development, especially since uh, Syringa, Milia Azadara, is a pest plant. So you can, can turn liabilities into assets. You can eradicate a pest and at the same time produce a, a, a valuable product. So it's really exciting. Please, can you respond a little bit? Uh, oh yes, uh, now I'm continuing with my PhD. Uh, I am planning to do field studies. Um, if I can get farmers where I can uh, test, uh, I think I'll want to work with extracts and powders and everything because then I think it's also going to be a problem because of dilutions and everything. I think if it's, if it's an extract uh, which you spray, will work better for yeah. that. Uh, yes. And yeah, also, yeah. yes, we are planning to isolate the main compounds yeah. to do the a, and structure. Um, Structural yeah. illustration. Yeah? Yes, for the uh, compounds. Please. Yeah. May I respectfully suggest that it would be luminoids, right? So, so yes, yes. That, that would be the focus, the luminoids, which are a class of terpenoids that's specific for meliaceae. And, and they have been very well studied. So you are not starting from scratch with a chemistry. Uh, the two main luminoids of Milia Zadarach are well known, for example, Milia Nuun and Milia Nol. We have isolated in the past. So uh, it's, uh, it is also quite easy to do TLC work on those luminoids. So they make the most beautiful uh, spot patterns on, on thin layer. If you do explorations, it's perhaps uh, something that you can consider um, apart from the uh, phytochemical screening, which is often false positives, you know. Um, yeah, no, thank you very much for a very interesting and well presented and on time lecture. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right, so uh, we, we can see if we can accommodate Palesa now. Uh, Patricia, sorry, but Patricia, uh, Patricia Padi. She had consistent difficulties to join us. Um, I don't know uh, if, if. Unfortunately, she's unfortunately she is not on. Yes, so we will then end this session. Uh, thank you very much to the organizers for organizing a wonderful SAAP conference. It was very good to be part of a SAAP conference again despite the limitations that we live under today. Thank you very much to the presenters for all their hard work to prepare these beautiful lectures. I enjoyed it very much. Uh, and also thank you to all the, part, uh, the viewers, shall we say, delegates or viewers for listening to this uh, session. Uh, I now close the session and we will probably have lunch now. Thank you very much.